Hello. Uh, so I think we can get started. Mm, you know, uh, this is my first time I come here for RT Summit. Uh, so I think uh, please allow me to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Tiejun Chen. I'm from uh, VMware R&D China, um, ATC team, uh, Advanced Technology Center. In our team, I'm working on some projects and some explorations. Uh, it in, uh, involves that IoT, Internet of Things, and uh, Photon Linux OS uh, enhancement, and uh, serverless and uh, edge computing, something like that. Yes, yeah, Unicorn also was my exploration. Um, before I joined VMware, I worked at several companies. Um, might, you might hear, hear some names, like uh, Venerable System. Uh, right there, I was responsible for Venerable Linux kernel and BSP development, and uh, Venerable the hypervisor and uh, our parallelized guest OS. And I uh, also worked at Intel OTC. Um, I was enabling some um, hardware features to open source technologies. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, my exploration, um, my proposal about uh, unikernels, especially something uh, related to uh, primarity and IoT. Uh, so each time I have to uh, make this declaration, you know, as I mentioned, just my personal exploration, so it's really not a roadmap or commitment from VMware so far. So um, just a um, few of parts, I think the, the first part I'd like to introduce some background about Unikernel and IoT and then go to my exploration. And now I name it Unilinks, and uh, I will finish my presentation with uh, one brief uh, summary. Okay, um, I think we first need to uh, understand this uh, architectural revolution. I mean, from a VM to Unikernel, what's happening? Just take a look at this picture. So VM, we know a virtual machine, which is a hybrid. So a couple years ago, a container like Docker was brought out. It's really love it, but it's not secure. One of the reasons I think uh, all containers share that one common host OS. So if something is wrong with this host OS, they could have big impact on all the containers. You might remember last year, we have that dirty copy on right, right? So um, instead, some people are trying to uh, trim down that uh, host OS and uh, just deploy one or few containers inside this VM. But you should notice that division, there's still that division between kernel space and user space. It still costs too much. So what's next? You need kernel. You kernel, we compile application into one uh, given operating system. Just keep those necessary components to make sure this application can run. It's like a library and we also compile them into either one whole image. So how to define it? So Unikernel I specialized uh, single dress space images constructed by using library operating system, Spe uh, specialized and single address space, and that's uh, LibOS. And I like to categorize them into a two a group. The first one is that um, like general purpose uh, Unikernel. It's like a library, but just derived from one general operating system. It supports um, like a politics compliant program. Another group is that uh, language specific unit kernel. Uh, like uh, uh, Murad OS, it's written with one specific language. It's still like a library, but specific to one programming language. So, um, so far there are a lot of existing unit kernels. I list some names here. So you can find something OSV, include OS, and Drawbridge. Drawbridge is from Microsoft. And Unix, Unix actually is a tool. It can help compile application into some existing Unix kernels. And you also can find some interesting um, solution. Like uh, Docker, uh, Docker um, you know, last year required that uh, Unix kernel system. It released the two project, HypeKit and VPKit. It can help a container can run with uh, Mac OS or Windows OS. Uh, even this year at the dog conference, uh, you know that Linux kit you still includes these two projects. And Mirai OS, I, um, it take uh, OSV, one existing unit kernel as uh, like a guest OS component to uh, provide very, very good that, uh, cloud infrastructure to support HPC, high performance computing. And NFV, the unit kernel is small and uh, that have very good uh, um, performance. So some people, uh, use uh, ISV and something like that to construct a very flexible OF solution, just like a research. Person. So um, I think based on that definition, you can understand uh, uh, uni what Unikernel can bring out. 
I think a single address uh, space, that means uh, it's easy to zero copy and it's uh, uh, easy to config every page and deploy that and a single running mode. So now we don't need that syscall. Instead, we just use function call. And uh, when most time, we just running one process, but multiple are set. So we don't need that heavy tab, uh, context switch. Like if we're talking about uh, x86, we don't need to reload the CS3. And uh, so compared to uh, VM, and even compared to container, Unikernel can provide some benefits. So first one is that you improve the security. Um, Unicorn steals the VM, but it's lightweight. And uh, it just keeps those necessary components, and each component has just less code. So the tech surface of Unikernel are very small. And at the same time, you can get that small uh, memory size and uh, the footprint, and uh, you can put that very quickly. You also can opt them because it's specialized. Uh, so we did some investigation and some discussion. We believe um, Unikernel really yielded that comparable performance. You can find some um, data from that public uh, claims. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, there are a lot of existing Unikernel, but it's very hard to see Unikernel in the production environment. So I think they are facing some challenge, like, uh, like compelling user case. Uh, we need more user case. And uh, compatibility. What I mean, you know, Unikernel is running one mode and one uh, single, a single address space, so those existing applications can run with Unikernel directly. And again, you also cannot run some existing tools or utility to uh, debug or monitor and, uh, uh, so the Unikernels. And uh, we also lack some standard to Unikernel. So after that, I'm thinking, what about, Uni what about Linux? I think Linux could be good candidate to the kernel because Linux is wide used, so it can bring out some valuable user case, and uh, it has a, a versatile different uh, that, uh, library, and, uh, and it also has some um, mature tools and utility. So I think we can bring Unikernel, bring a community Linux as a Unikernel to um, make Unikernel succeed. And uh, I also think, uh, you know, in my study, Linux is like in the process of development. Every year you can find some interesting optimization or some acceleration. I think this technology still can benefit Unikernel. And we also have some community. It's a very important fact to um, make Unikernel to succeed us. So um, based on the challenge, talk about the challenge. So the first question uh, that you the case. So I'm trying to figure out some potential but valuable user case like IO intensive application. Uh, Unikernel aims to uh, improve the network performance. We have uh, some research to use the Unikernel. And we all have some serverless. Uh, I'm not sure everyone heard here that uh, serverless. Mm. Serverless, uh, simple, simple speaking, serverless is that the cloud computing code execution mode. Um, that means you just need to focus on writing code and uploading your code to the cloud, but without managing and providing your resource, your server, serverless. So this word, serverless? serverless. What is that? Uh, serverless means just, you just need to write code, right? Um, all the time, you, um, besides you write code, you also have to configure which VM and the memory size and the memory CPU, you have to configure that, right? So if you um, service the model, that means you just need to write code, Upload the code to the public cloud provider, and, but you don't need to care about uh, which resource you should configure. So instead, the cloud pro provider will help you uh, run your code on demand and uh, allocate resources automatically and, uh, and uh, do something uh, automatic, uh, auto scaling. Um, does that make sense? Okay. So this is a very promising model. Most of the public cloud providers, like Amazon and uh, Google and uh, uh, Azure, also have this own that uh, serverless model implementation. You know, VMware also have VMware um, uh, service on this uh, on this sphere infrastructure implementation. Um, mm, but you know, basically, they just use the container to carry out the function. We also talk about the uh, kernel can compete with the uh, container. So I think we can use the Unikernel to carry out something. 
And another thing I want to mention here is that service, um, that, that difference between service and the function as service. So most times people call service as a function as service, but there's really a, a difference between them. Service means that you don't need to care that resource allocation. Function service means that the scheduling unit should be function. So think about this. Sometimes some function should work together. They can work efficiently, and because probably they share some resources. And sometimes you may need one function to trigger another function to, uh, to finish one com um, complicated uh, task. And uh, you also need to consider QoS. So I think uh, that um, VM should be a good complement um, to the unique uh, service uh, implementation. And blockchain, uh, blockchain also um, you know, like hyperledger. Hyperledger uh, uses that container to carry out sort of a chain code. Now we still can use the unique kernel to carry out the chain code. And machine learning, mm, this is why another reason I want to uh, convert links to a uh, unique kernel. Now these, those existing unique kernels don't support the CPU. But we have links. Links can support the GPU, and we have that uh, uh, HMM, that means heterogeneous memory monument. So I think this can help unicorn and links to support that machine learning. But today I'd like to focus on IoT. So first, let's take a look at the picture. And this is one, um, I think, the typical IoT architecture. So um, from uh, left side to the right side, the thin and that's the right side is the IoT cloud, the edge and the fog in the middle. Thin, uh, that's something we are talking about, the sensor and the actuator. So uh, in the case of IoT, that means we need to connect uh, these devices to the cloud, to the internet. But uh, the reality is uh, not every device can connect to the internet directly. Uh, some, some devices can connect to the internet, like CCTV or camera in the public. They are sort of IP capable, so it's easy to connect them to the internet. But the huge, massive amount of devices, we cannot do that. They just have some uh, low, uh, short range of connectivity protocol, like ZigBee and Bluetooth, or some CAN bus on the ice for 85, something like that. So we need that some devices help them connect them to the internet. Uh, this device is uh, running on the edge side. So Basically, and there's some uh, different uh, situation uh, scenario like uh, mm, we need the IoT gateway, and we need some embedded PC or some uh, data center, or even we have some um, long range that connectivity protocol like LoRa and uh, MB IoT. We still need MB that MB IoT station base station. So uh, they are facing some uh, problem like you know. For example, an um, IoT based station, that means you have to uh, fix some problem like multi tenancy. One device uh, connects one um, IoT based station, but it is moving. It will uh, connect another base station. That means the base station will connect different uh, devices from different vendors. So, how to uh, use IoT to support that um, unicorn uh, to support IoT? So I'd like to uh, divide IoT from two, uh, div two uh, groups. The first one, IoT Cloud, I talk about the microservice and the server, and the service. Uh, we can use Unicorn to replace the container. And uh, for the IoT Edge and Fog, uh, you know, when we talk about IoT, um, these IoT devices are resource constrained. So Unicorn are very small and small and uh, boot uh, very quickly, and it's very secure. So I think it's very suitable for the IoT devices. Uh, but, but that means you know, uh, we need that virtualization, virtualization to support that unique kernel. It's uh, one of the challenges we should be considered. And another thing is uh, most existing unique kernels doesn't act to um, support some feature specific to IoT, like a power save, and that multiple different architecture and real-time requirement. So um, I have some... Um, this uh, conclusion, I think Unicorn can very play for the IoT um, because, uh, as I talk about, uh, we, you know, I'm working on some um, IoT project. We did some investigation. There's a trend that thrive we are at the edge side. So we need the virtualization. Why? Because virtualization can help us address some problem like a security issue and the multiple tendency and the fragmentation and edge computing. So, 
And uh, again, that IO device um, is equivalent to that embedded system, the unit kernel. Uh, and uh, according to one public study, two thirds of IoT gateways are deployed with Linux. So unit kernel Linux uh, has that, uh, already has this good ecosystem. And another reason is the uh, unit kernel Linux can run on bare metal. I think there's no doubt. So, I, so to me, I see this worth exploring um, if we can unit kernel Linux and uh, we can deploy that in the case of IoT. So our solution, um, our goal is to uh, want to explore what's the best platform for running Union kernel case. And uh, we need to integrate or support some existing Union kernel. And uh, more important, uh, I'd like to convert links to Union kernel and limit the Union links and some explorations. And uh, today I just focus on that, how to convert links to Union kernel. So, you know, converting links to Union kernel is very difficult because links is a general operating system. Uh, it's designed to support multiple processes and has two different modes, and uh, that all components are tuple, uh, tightly coupled. And uh, we also need to consider if we can prove that performance. I skip something. Just focus on. Okay, draw. Uh, how could we possibly achieve this? So, from the Linux perspective. That means Unicorn Links is running with one mode. Now we are talking about x 64 That means uh, Unicorn Links, Unilinx is running with that uh, super, uh, super mode as the room zero. How to, we can, um, how to do this? So we need to modify some macros like USCS and DSDS and that um, RPL entry to make sure US staff uh, can run with that um, kernel mode. And we also need a IST, interrupt step table. Uh, what does it mean? So, um, uh, you know, normally uh, we have two different modes, kernel mode and user mode. So uh, CPU can automatically switch that stack between kernel stack and to user stack, uh, to kernel stack to a user stack. But now we just have one mode. So think about this uh, scenario. The user stack is running with the user stack, but sometimes we need to expand the user stack, so it will trigger that page fault. But at this certain moment, your stack is not valid. CPU want to see that rest of the information like a flag and ISP something. So, but stack that your stack is not valid, so it will trigger another fault, double fault. So. But again, at this time, the stack is still not valid, so CTU have to uh, shut down. So how to address this problem? So we have that, uh, I, so um, I, I, x 64 uh, has this feature, interrupt uh, stack table. So that means this table can switch to the specific stack automatically. And uh, so far, there can be uh, up to seven entries in that uh, per CPU and uh, the IST, um, in, uh, code is uh, indexed into that TSS, task state segment, and that um, each, that, uh, T, uh, each IST entry can point to different uh, stack. So this can help address this problem. And we, as all, uh, you know, uh, we are running, one, the, run, running with one mode, so we don't need the fun, uh, system call, so we should uh, modify VDSO, make sure just jump to that function. And uh, monitor stack, in some cases, some few cases, maybe your application is uh, are compiled with that hard code, uh, that system call. So we need to uh, switch the user stack to kernel stack. That's a few cases. And now single address space, uh, we can run one process, so we cannot provide a fork. I think it's easy to understand. So, uh, we need to uh, opt them, uh, like uh, we want to get the smaller size and the footprint. Typically, we can use the conf uh, key configure to disable those unnecessary components. And uh, some uh, work we also need to do, like uh, mm. we should uh, remove some, uh, some uh, system call. Just keep those necessary, uh, necessary system call according to different application requirement. And uh, zero copy, I mean, no, we just is running with one mode. We do need to check between kernel space and your space. We do need to move something from kernel space to your space. 
It's not necessary. She should be gone. And scheduler, uh, you know, normally it has, uh, besides that uh, idle and stop, we have CFS and RT and deadline. Mm, but in some cases, we just run one process. I make sure I want to uh, decouple this scheduler to make sure we can configure that scheduler according to different uh, that requirement. And uh, live to GitHub stack, so uh, Linux has that very good uh, network stack, but it's complicated because Linux want to address a different network scenario. But now we need that live to TCP IP stack, like uh, live to IP, something like that. I think uh, already there's some existing project and they are working on this similar thing. Um, Normally, it has a different uh, variant, um, like they have that um, GSQT and SE links, and we also have a prim anti links. So I think we still can use that. Now, we Unicorn links can have that uh, prim anti uh, Unicorn links. It's based on prim anti links, and uh, it can support some case. So, we like airbag in the car and brake. And, uh, but it had a different scenario, so that uh, biomental, as I mentioned, uh, it's easy to run uh, Unicorn and Linux. But uh, what about the virtualization environment? It's very different. So virtualization means that, that layer between um, hardware and uh, operating system. So that means that the two levels of that um, um, scheduling, um, scheduling structure. I mean, the hypervisor will schedule that uh, physical CPU um, to that uh, schedule uh, vCPU to that physical CPU. This is the first level that scheduler. The second level that we talk about the traditional scheduler, and this is inside that VM. So based on these that, uh, two levels of scheduling, so we are facing some challenges. Um, so how to guarantee we still can get that uh, correct time behavior? So two level schedule structure. And that um, more importantly, hypervisor has no knowledge of what's running in the, inside the VM. And the memory management, uh, no, that means um, dynamic memory management uh, cannot, uh, will uh, introduce some uh, unpredictable behavior. So we need to consider this. And another um, problem is the lock holder preemption problem. Mm. How to explain that? So that means, uh, for example, uh, we have one guest OS. We have uh, two thread, thread A and thread B. Thread A uh, is holding uh, one uh, slug, is running one CPU on CPU A, and another thread is, uh, is running on another uh, vCPU, but being uh, waited for another uh, that uh, log. But at this moment, uh, hypervisor probably will uh, schedule out the uh, vCPU a. So that means that uh, thread B, and now it is running on vCPU on B, it actually is a wasting CPU time. So how could we can address these challenges? I think for the um, guest OS, we can use that primitive links. But uh, um, what we should do, we need to add some help call. Uh, like so when you hold this lock, you should uh, um, issue a hyper um, call to that um, hypervisor. That hypervisor know uh, you are running that RT, RT workload or you are holding that uh, um, the clock. So um, hypervisor would not uh, schedule this uh, vCPU from this uh, physical CPU. And uh, memory allocation. So um, to avoid that um, something that could be um, burn out from that memory um, Allocation, dynamic memory allocation. Um, we have to preserve some memory resource to make sure uh, we can call that help call directly and to allocate some resource from this resource pool to support IT workload. Um, direct interrupt. What that means? So, and um, most of um, CPU, if they are support, if they support that virtualization technology, they still have this feature of direct interrupt to the that vCPU. Okay. Um, another part is the compatibility. So um, there are different scenarios. If you have a source code, we just need to pre-compile some library. Right there, we replace that system call with that function call. 
you just need to recompile application with this new, this sort of a new library. But if you just have a binary, it is uh, compiled with some uh, compile flag like a uh, shared and pick. I think we can load that our pre-compile that library to resolve that uh, system call to a function call. But if not, um, here, I think it should be a very few case. I don't care about this few case. So multiple process, uh, this is another question. So um, my principle is that if your application can be designed to support, it um, can be designed to run, to be running as that multiple uh, thread, you need to uh, re uh, redesign your application. If you cannot do that, because that can uh, get that best benefits from the unicron and the links. If not, I think uh, one is straightforward. So one fork just trigger one uh, unilinks instance, but that means IPC becomes that inter VM communication. So we need to configure out that faster but secure uh, VM communication. Fortunately, uh, in the case of x86, we have the VM function. This pretty instruction can help us. Uh, another way is the PCID uh, process contact identifier. Um, this like the, it can tag TLB. So that means that if you, you want to uh, switch uh, between different uh, um, process, um, but you don't need that um, invalid the TLB, it's very lively. Um, but this feature just has limited bits. So I use this to um, support multiple, thread, multiple process just for that debug tool and mounted tool. And then that people still can use those existing tool or utility to um, develop that unikernel. Uh, another way, uh, you use Linux. Using Linux, use Linux is that MMU uh, less, uh, but unfortunately, this doesn't support x86. Um, uh, I'm thinking about this uh, before, but uh, it doesn't support x86. Uh, and uh, another side effect is uh, it still has not a fork. It just supports that v fork. Um, I hope I take some time to figure out if we can take something from this music mix. Um, this goal, um, I'm trying to, what, what, what I'm trying to do is, uh, I hope, because music links can support that multiple task in the one uh, single address space. Uh, debug tools, I think this, as I talked about that uh, PCID, I think this help us um, support those existing tools and unique kernel, uh, that uh, utility. Uh, um, one thing I want to like to mention here is that key dump. You know, key dump is a very good tool to debug if you kind of panic or chronic. But in the pro, um, but that means that we have to load that. Uh, we have to reserve that uh, um, uh, memory space and to load that uh, sort of a capture kernel. This is not good in the production environment. In the production environment. So, what am I trying to do is. We just need to resolve that virtual space range, but we don't allocate the physical address space and we don't map them. But one day, if we want to debug something with that key dump, we can enable bottom driver. Bottom driver can uh, allocate some physical memory from hypervisor and then map them to this uh, virtual address and then load that capture kernel and you can enable that key dump. Uh, monitor. Um, this, uh, uh, like that OSV, um, I just integrate one mini more that HDB thread. But instead, of we can, here we can connect uh, those existing uh, uh, debug uh, monitor to like a uh, top or something like that. And uh, this log, I think, is easy to understand. Um, we have for VMware, we have that vSphere log inside. It supports that syslog format. So we just need to connect that remote syslog to this uh, our log inside to make sure we can. Um, to log a unit kernel. And uh, we also some uh, enhancement about uh, um, fast boot and that uh, virtualization enhancement. Fast boot, um, the sorry, like uh, we can use, uh, we can integrate one um, small uh, bootloader inside this VM to skip that BIOS. We also can use that GP to um, replace ACPI partially. And now, for the virtualization, so we know uh, which device and which bus we will uh, allocate to this VM. So we just do that one one uh, bus probe and the device probe. Uh, virtualization, uh, there are some ways listed here. 
uh, mostly they can help us to reduce that uh, VM exit, this overhead, to, prob um, to improve our performance. Um, besides the unicorn links, uh, we need uh, some tools and to how help us configure to build this uh, um, unique links, how to build application to our unicorn links. Uh, okay, uh, this part is about management. It's very, actually, it's very similar to Docker. So like this, we have a unicorn manager. This is a, call, um, this is a controller of our management. It can um, control all unicorn application and also expose its functionality to that unicorn client uh, by the REST API. And uh, we also can load that uh, unicorn application image um, to that local and also um, to that cloud registry. If we, when you want to run a unicorn application, if you cannot find that in the local, just uh, pull that from the cloud to uh, save that in the um, Mm, local uh, registry. Another thing I want to mention is VDFS. VDFS is a virtual distributed file system. Mm, basically, it's based on the what I O. What I O that nine P and I O and device, what I O device and nine P on the file system, and uh, this can help. What this can help to do is that um, help Unikernel do something like a uh, disk less. So this we can put links, uh, put unicorn links very quickly. Uh, so I think this is what I talk about. So, um, without, um, we talk about unicorn um, is very small and fast and quick boat. So it's a very um, good candidate to the cloud and to the IoT. And uh, but uh, um, those existing unicorn um, face some challenges. So have yet to gain large popularity, and uh, we have. Now they are facing some challenges, so I'm trying to come out with this solution, Unilinks, to uh, make sure we can boost the Unikernel. And the product links is very suitable for IoT. Um, no matter we are talking about IoT Cloud, and we talk about IoT Azure and IoT Fog. So, so far I have found that the POC, I can compile that um, Hello World to that Unilinks. I can put that with the QM or with our EXI. Um, so it's still at the early stage. Um, but uh, uh, another thing I want to mention here is, uh, um, in my IoT project, I already deployed that unikernel, one existing unikernel, OSV. Uh, it's um, working as that uh, MQT broke. MQT is the IoT protocol um, to help connect, uh, communicate uh, between that uh, um, different machine. Okay. This is some rough. So this is some, um, something I'm going to talk about. So any question? Um, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, one question. I, I, okay. Uh, I didn't get yet um, why you think I mean, there's a lot of work, a lot of interesting technical work to be done there to get to this Linux-based Unikernel thing. But I didn't get actually why you think or what is the point? What will make this approach more successful than OSV, for example? Oh, the v Sorry. OSV. OSV. Yeah. Okay. Why do you think it would be more successful uh, than OSV? So, um, I'm not sure if you remember, I mentioned some uh, valuable user case, like uh, uh, that FV and the serverless and that um, blockchain and uh, like that machine link, right? I think OSV cannot do this. Yeah, the point is this, this approach has been more or less abandoned. It was a bet that they could achieve better performance with the OSV approach, Unicorn uh, approach, so. but it didn't went off. But Unicorn is also can support some potential user cases. And I mentioned another reason, I think Unicorn, uh, Unilinx can support multiple process to some extent, right? This is one important reason people don't like to use that uh, OSV, because you have, uh, the first reason, you just can run one process sometimes. You also cannot use some uh, existing tool debug. For example, you cannot SH, right? You cannot SH, you cannot use some key dump or some probe and half trees. OSV doesn't support this feature, but Linux can do this thing. So this is my first, uh, okay. So your assumption is that you don't need to port the applications over to run on this unikernel, Linux-based unikernel approach. So applications won't be touched yeah. for this. Yeah. I know that there's a lot of work I should do. So. Because, as I mentioned, it's harder to decouple that component. So 
so far that uh, the last image is still bigger. Thank you. Just uh, as you had a slide on the uh, real-time features, right? Can you just tell us a bit more which use cases you have in mind? What uh, timing constraints, granularity you see in this, in the scenarios you have in mind here? So you're the case, right? About real-time features of this real -time kernel time. approach. Yeah, real-time features. Sorry for my. Thank you. Uh, Yeah, so, um, the slide, there was a slide with even scared deadline in there, I think. But <laughs> it was a slide with also scared deadline in, uh, in the slide. But yeah, the idea is to, about timing behavior, what would you expect? What would be like the ideal, the target uh, uh, latency for this uh, architecture? Oh, so, um, because I, based on some discussion and the investigation, um, the first thing we should do, because in, in the IoT, we need virtualization. Why we need virtualization? Because virtualization can help address that security issue, multi-tenancy. Uh, so this is, uh, that this um, makes sense to you. So, I mean, do you agree, uh, do you agree uh, we need virtualization in the IoT? Yeah, sure. So, so now, uh, but IoT needs a uh, real-time requirement, because uh, most people are talking about edge computing. Edge computing means that uh, we need to do something um, like real-time data analytics, like we have a self-drive car. So you don't need, uh, you, you cannot depend on this. You push your massive data to the cloud, and then cloud make some analytics and uh, push the action to you, uh, to the car, and let the car to take the next step. Sometimes it's latency, right? And sometimes the connection may be broken. So you cannot depend on this situation. So we need real-time data analytics at each side. So in this case, we need real-time links. At something uh, in some uh, research we are doing, we are investigating into uh, access network packet processing, and uh, in the timing, the timing that we can do with Linux so to using Linux, so and particularly scheduling for uh, isolating uh, packet processing tasks uh, among each other, uh, as well as guaranteeing providing timing guarantees to these packet processing different packet processing engines on the same platform. Uh, it is in an NFB context, in a network function virtualization yeah, yeah. context. Yeah. So, okay, okay thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.